Hey y'all, I'm your host Tamaje, and welcome to another episode of Rewatch, a podcast where I binge watch your favorite shows as fast as I can. Last week we got to spin a wheel and we landed on the ABC hit drama series Scandal. Scandal ran from 2012 to 2018 with 124 episodes over seven seasons. In this episode of Rewatch, we're going to be covering season one and season two A. I'm splitting them up like this because season one was really short and season two is really long. Season one has seven episodes while season two has 22. And I think it could be a little bit more fun this way. Before we jump into it, I just want to mention that this series comes from one of the greatest showrunners of the times, the incomparable Shonda Rhimes. Yes, the mind behind Grey's Anatomy, Private Practice, How to Get Away with Murder, and more recently, Inventing Anna. So pretty much whatever she touches turns to gold. So just know that this is gonna be good. Let's get into it. And as always, there will be spoilers. Scandal takes place in Washington, D.C. and is centered around Olivia Pope, played by Carrie Washington, who is a political fixer and runs Olivia Pope and Associates. Her associates in season one are Stephen Finch, played by Henry Ian Cusick, Harrison Wright, played by Columbus Short, Abby Whelan, played by Darby Stanchfield, Quinn Perkins, played by Kaylee Lowe's, and Huck, played by Guillermo Diaz. The first episode of the series opens up in a quick paced walk into the bar where we meet Quinn who thinks she's walking into a blind date that actually turns out to be a job interview of sorts. Well, more like she's handed her dream job on a silver platter. Meanwhile, Olivia and the other associates are handling a case. A briefcase and a box get exchanged. And the next thing you know, we're at Liv's office and a Russian ambassador is taking his baby out of the box and we just witnessed their ransom exchange. The next thing you know, a very handsome gentleman known as Sully St. James, aka an American war hero, stumbles into the firm covered in blood. He just fled the scene where his girlfriend had been brutally murdered. The group votes whether or not to keep his case or let him figure it out on his own. Everyone votes no except for Liv who obviously supersedes the vote because her name's on the door. Now this show constantly works on a lot of storylines at one time so I hope things don't get confusing for you guys. While they're working on Sully's case Liv gets a phone call from her good old buddy Cyrus Bean being played by Jeff Perry who is the president's chief of staff. Apparently some White House aide named Amanda Tanner has been spouting off at the mouth about having an affair with the 44th president Fitzgerald Thomas Grant III, played by Tony Goldwyn. That also means our main man, Barry O, doesn't exist in this world. And that somewhere my mother is shedding a tear right about now. Liv, as a favor, goes to talk to Amanda and essentially tells her that if she keeps telling lies, Liv is going to ruin her whole life. After this encounter essentially breaks Amanda into a million pieces, she tries to kill herself. Thankfully unsuccessful, Quinn, by her side at the hospital, hears her story and is suddenly sounding pretty believable. She goes on and on about their relationship and how he calls her sweet baby which is the title of the episode by the way she tells this to Liv and it perks her ears Liv goes to confront the president face to face to tell him what she knows they enter in somewhat of a screaming match and Fitz proclaims you know there's only one person that I love and here's the kicker y'all kisses Olivia passionately in the Oval Office. Cyrus overhears the arguing and enters into the Oval Office only to find them kissing. Y'all can probably figure out how Olivia knew about the whole sweet baby thing, huh? Meanwhile, the team scrambles and works to find Sully an alibi for him not killing his girlfriend. But unfortunately, Sully does not want to use it. He is caught on camera kissing a man. But as an ultra conservative right wing Republican war hero, he refuses to use this alibi and wants them to find another way. As they are sure on time, there's no other way for them to protect Sully. Liv convinces him to own his sexuality by telling him that he can't change who he is and he shouldn't be ashamed of that. Her own rousing speech convinces her to take on Amanda as a new client because she wants to tell her story to the media. Y'all, this show is intense. Everyone's a fast talker and I'm talking like Gilmore Girls levels of speed. And people are getting red left and right in this very short seven episode season. So much happens. We have the city's top madam getting arrested, a rich kid rape charge, Amanda Tanner pregnancy, a plane crash. There's just so much happening in so little time. But it doesn't feel rushed or overwhelmed. The writers did an amazing job with giving everything the amount of time that they needed. 
So this brings me to my favorite episode of the season, which it was incredibly difficult to choose. All of them were so good. This definitely has got to be one of my favorite shows of all time, and it's probably definitely in the top 20. So for season one, my favorite episode is episode five, Crash and Burn. I'm going to give a little bit of context, though. In the episode before this, we see Amanda Tanner get bound and gagged and injected with a mysterious substance, and we don't know what's happened to her. All right, so that's pretty much all the pretext you should need for this one. Everyone is looking for Amanda until they get a call about a plane crash. So Liv tasks Huck with finding her. She and mostly everyone else focus on the plane crash. The plane that crashed was carrying 120 people, including a senator. After the plane goes down, the airline places blame on the pilot. Unfortunately for optics, the pilot was an alcoholic who'd been sober for 20 years though. Her husband begs and pleads with OPA, telling them that his wife is innocent and it couldn't have been her fault because she hasn't touched any alcohol. While Liv is handling the plane crash, Fitz and Cyrus are trying to make history by passing the Dream Act, which essentially is the same one as our Dream Act. It's kind of messed up because they're definitely piggybacking off the fact that the U.S. Senator who died wanted this act passed, but I guess a win is a win in politics. Huck ends up finding Amanda Tanner's kidnapper and he's someone he knows from the past just from knowing that he was the one who took Amanda Huck now knows that she's dead. After Huck tells Olivia this news, she immediately assumes that Fitz had her killed. Of course, Liv gets Fitz on the phone and he denies everything. And she tells him that if he didn't have her killed, then they both know who did. Alluding to Cyrus, who would do anything to protect Fitz's presidency. Olivia asked Huck to find Amanda's body. And the only way he can do that is by torturing Charlie, the kidnapper. And by torture, I literally mean gruesome body torture with drills and scalpels and that's all I'm to say about that. Fitz and Cyrus are trying to get the Dream Act passed and they have it down to a tie and that means they have to go to the vice president Sally Langston played by Kate Burton aka Meredith Grey's mother to break the tie. Now some things you need to know about Sally is that she's probably as far right as you can go and doesn't want the Dream Act to be enacted. She believes that the children of illegal immigrants gaining citizenship is a not God's plan. And yes, I'm pretty sure that's a literal quote. At least the not God's plan part. To get her vote on this, Fitz threatens her with a lack of endorsement for when she tries to run for president and then she signs off finally. After Fitz gets her approval, Cyrus decides to hit him with some bad news and tells him that he was sent an audio blackmail tape of him and Amanda Tanner doing the horizontal hokey pokey, if you know what I mean. Meanwhile, Huck finishes torturing Charlie and gets the information of where Amanda's body can be found, which is under a bridge and in the water. Eventually, the pilot's name gets cleared after it's learned that it was a mechanical failure that caused the crash. Unfortunately, an overworked employee duplicated one of the reports that stated of the plane's malfunction, and because of this oversight, 120 people were killed. Amanda's father comes to identify her body and with the autopsy it's revealed that the baby wasn't Fitz's. As Olivia gets the news over the phone, there's a knock at the door and there stands Fitz. I think I like this episode so much because they layer the stories really well. Because as you can tell, there's about three different storylines happening at once. But all of them get their resolution by the end of the episode. It's got the Dream Act pass, though in real life that wouldn't happen until 2021. But clearly Shonda had a dream. Huck tortures Charlie even though he didn't want to, but he still had a good time doing it. And helped find Amanda's body. And the pilot's name is cleared. Okay, y'all, let's get to the best character of the season. Obviously, it's a no-brainer. It's Olivia. I know, I know. Pretend to be shocked. But how could you not think that Olivia Carolyn Pope isn't the best character of the season. She's one of the greatest female characters of all time. Miss Ma'am was running her own company, solving the problems of some of the world's most important political leaders, not just the ones in DC. Like Liv is just that girl. Her confidence, her outfits, her adaptability. There's almost nothing you can throw at her that'll mess her up except for Fitz. Fitz is the only thing that can make Olivia crumble. He's the only one who can see past the whole gladiator in a suit thing. He makes her human and brings her back down to earth. And now I know we're supposed to be mad at her for being the mistress, but it's so hard to do when the show just keeps pulling them back together and almost with his wife's approval. There's literally a scene between Millie, played by Bellamy Young, and Liv where she's mad at her because she broke Fitz's heart. She quite literally says that Liv was supposed to do her job and keep him happy and she failed at that like how can you root against that when the wife seems to be rooting for them 
All right, now let's get to my least favorite character of the season because some people were just so terrible and some people were just the bad guys. So do I choose terrible or do I choose the bad guy? It's hard, but I'm going to pick terrible because the bad guy was just doing his job being a villain and the terrible ones are the ones who think that they are the good guys. And that means I'm choosing Cyrus as my least favorite character of the season. I'm choosing Cyrus because this whole season is ran on the fact that Cyrus didn't know that Pitts and Olivia had an affair, which he walks in on them kissing and is literally shocked that neither of them would have told him what was going on because he was left out of the loop. It seems like from the moment that he knew he wanted to get between them, almost like the man was jealous of something, which makes zero sense to me because Cyrus is gay and married and Fitz is straight and married and has two girls, technically three if we count Amanda. But this ain't about Fitz. Cyrus at one point does that whole thing where you lie to both parties so they hate each other like middle school you know what I mean he also has Amanda Tanner killed he constantly talks about how he put Fitz in the White House he struggles with power because he knows that as close as he is to the presidency he'll never have the title like dude was doing the most at all times all right time for the most shocking part of season one I bet you guys can guess how it ends. Most shocking episode of season one was episode six titled The Trail. This episode is one of my favorite types, a flashback episode. It first opens up with Fitz coming into Liv's apartment and making her listen to the audio tape. Then our flashback starts. It takes place two years right before the presidential election. Fitz is falling behind and Liv is brought up to save the campaign. She immediately alludes that the fact he's falling behind is due to the fact that he doesn't and I'm gonna keep it PG and say look like he's in love with his wife but let's just say Liv had a bit more of a colorful way of saying it he hears this and immediately wants her off the campaign Cyrus convinces him that she's just what he needs to save the campaign and Fitz takes it upon himself to apologize to Liv now from the moment these two have their first conversation oh my gosh the heat is on and they're just literally standing in a hallway talking as they're speaking the eye contact is so intense and she realizes that the real reason he wants her off the campaign is because of his undue attraction to her i mean they literally have their own theme when they're alone together it's literally called the light like these people burn for each other and they definitely shouldn't be Liv makes it her duty to get fits in the white house and by doing that she has to make millie and fits look like they're still in love they fake it up and down the campaign trail with sticky ice cream kisses and a fake miscarriage story that sways the female republican voters on their side they almost didn't make it after a rumor that millie was having an affair started making its way around the campaign trail while it was untrue the pictures made it look pretty convincing millie's miscarriage story put them back on top at fitz dismay he couldn't believe that his wife could be such a dishonorable person one of the most jaw-dropping moments of this episode to me was when fitz was on stage Stage during a debate and is prompted about his marriage and he simply states that he's in love with an incredible woman but baby he was not talking about Millie because the entire time he's staring at Olivia freaking Pope. I find it interesting that at this point in the flashback, we don't see Olivia and Fitz really being a couple, but yet he proclaims his love for her anyway. We've never seen so much as a kiss, but after this proclamation, they sit together on the bus and he confides in her. It seems like he's saying all the right things like, what kind of coward was I to marry her and not wait for you? Ooh, chills. They secretly hold hands for the first time on screen after this after they arrive to their intended destination everyone's off to their rooms but this night olivia doesn't go to her own room and her and fitz have their first time but that's after he says the iconic take off your clothes that formed a litz forever but what Liv and Fitz didn't know is that they were being recorded by the ops the other Republican candidate aka Sally Langston's team were spying on them her campaign manager Billy tried to give her the tape but it's too late she's already accepted Fitz's position as his VP running mate and it's revealed that Amanda Tanner was also working on Sally's campaign the entire time we snap back to the present as Liv realizes that the tape doesn't have Amanda Tanner on it, but it has her at the same time Quinn's reporter boyfriend discovers that Billy was Amanda Tanner's boyfriend and that the whole thing has been orchestrated by him and that he's the father of her child right before Fitz leaves Olivia's place they have one last minute together and in this minute they sit on Liv's couch and simply hold each other 
The physical pain on their faces is truly some good acting. Like in the silence of the scene, you can really see how much pain they're in knowing that they only have a minute to pretend that life's okay with them being together. Fitz leaves and we end up back at Quinn's boyfriend's place and Billy shows up to address the Amanda Tanner allegations from him. Billy gets upset with Gideon because he feels like that he should have caught on faster because he laid out everything for him and he pretty much calls him a moron for being stupid and not getting it quick enough. Gideon reveals the fact that he knows that Amanda's baby is his. Billy stabs him in the neck and the episode ends with us not knowing if he'll live or die aka a cliffhanger. Now that episode was so shocking to me over and over again, mostly because of the audacity it fits. Just the way he looks at Olivia in public is incriminating all by itself. Like Millie is truly better than me because if my husband was looking at another woman like that, we would have been scrapping on that campaign trail. Like were these people just pretending to be blind or was it for the goods of the campaign to shut up and ignore it? And then with Billy being the dad and the boyfriend and him freaking out and stabbing Gideon in the neck with a pair of scissors, like the reveals were just so good. Now the next episode was good, great even, but honestly, it's not worth talking about until the last five minutes, so we'll summarize it real quick in just a few lines. Billy tells the media that Amanda Tanner was having an affair with the president. Liv and Millie cover it up by saying it was Millie on the tape. Millie has to be pregnant because that's what she told the media. Quinn is in her real name. She tells the team her real story. Now, I know some things might sound left out, but the opener of season two pretty much answers all the questions that you probably have. It's been six months where the end of season one left us. Season two opens up with Millie pregnant for real this time. Fitz and Millie are gearing up for an on-air gender reveal for America's baby, as they're calling it. It's a boy, by the way. Quinn, whose real name is Lindsay Dwyer, is on trial for domestic terrorism. Abby is super skeptical of Quinn and thinks that she actually did the crime. And the crime is blowing up her ex-boyfriend's job, killing seven other people. To Abby, the story doesn't make sense, which I guess to the average person, the story wouldn't. Quinn says she got drunk, left a voicemail to her boyfriend because she thought he was cheating on her, saying that she'd kill him. And then the next day, he gets blown up. She hid at a motel because she was scared. And then two days later, she woke up in DC with a new identity. Totally believable, right? David Rosen, played by Joshua Molina, is prosecuting the case and is seeking the death penalty, which I didn't even know Washington, D.C. still had the death penalty. The case is not going well, and it seems like the jury wants to fry Quinn. In the meantime, Liv's new client needs our help because he's found a hidden camera in his office the night after he decided to hook up with the date in there. To save him, they end up spinning it into a puff piece, having him apologize to the American people, and then he shifts his focus to his political agendas. He goes on late night talk shows and is in the tabloids, but doesn't have any major political repercussions on him because Olivia is just that good. Somehow, Quinn is found innocent because Liv called in a favor and saved her hide. And then at the end of the episode, we see what actually happened to Quinn and that her new life was fabricated by Olivia and Huck. This opener was just okay to me. I feel like they should have focused more on Quinn's trial. It was kind of just sprinkled in there. I feel like it was in and out too quick. We should have seen her be more traumatized by jail or more of the in and outs of the jurors room. Like, yes, we got to have a sneak peek of how the jury would vote because the team stalked the jury. I would have liked to see more intel. Like the trial just ended too quickly. It was just Quinn's innocent because Liv called in a favor. The end. Whack. But anyway, let's get to the faves. All right. My favorite episode of season two is episode two titled The Other Woman. And yes, it talks about exactly what you think it'd talk about based on the title. Fitz and Liv have been having secret nighttime phone calls that Liv is pretending to hate, but she actually loves it because she loves that man. After they get into a little bit of a spat on the phone, she gets another phone call about America's preacher gone missing. The team scrambles around town to find him. And when they track him down to a hotel, they find him dead. But that's not all they find. They find him dead on top of a woman who's handcuffed to the bed. Olivia asks Huck what he'd need to get rid of the body and he mentions a whole bunch of weird stuff like a saw and some trash bags and she simply just wanted to know what he needed to move him back to his own house. 
When they try to pay this woman, who they initially thought was a hooker off, to sign the NDA, she refuses. And it turns out that it's because this woman has been his mistress for years. She decides that she wants $6 million in return of her signature. The wife tries to counter her offer over and over again because she thinks she doesn't have any reason to pay her that much money. Turns out that the mistress has a son who's the spitting image of his father the pastor. In the meantime, Millie notifies Fitz of Pastor Drake's death because they were good friends, but Fitz decides to be a jerk before she could tell him because he's just mean to her sometimes. And also because he's stressed out about this photo he saw of kids being massacred and is trying to figure out if he wants to go to war over it or not. Turns out that the photo was faked not by Cyrus, which we originally thought, but by the director of the CIA. Fitz is supposed to speak at the pastor's funeral, and so Melly goes to see the wife, as any good first lady would do to another, but Pastor Drake's wife has taken a sedative and is a little zooted, so she lets it slip in front of an entire room of people, but not loud enough so they can hear that he had a mistress. Melly clears the room of everyone, including Olivia, and she comforts the wife. She gives her the, you're the wife speech. It was powerful, but also so sad. She tells her, you're his wife, right to the end. Olivia can hear everything that Millie is saying to her on the other side of the door, and it's eating her up inside because every night she's having conversation with Millie's husband. At the end of the day, Millie is the wife and Olivia is the mistress. At the last minute, the pastor's mistress tries to back out of the NDA, saying she wants more money, but in reality, she doesn't want more money. She wants more time. She wants real Christmas for her little family and not to be a shameful secret, and that she wants to go to the funeral and say her proper goodbyes. The wife allows this because it's probably the last thing she'll ever have to do with her. And at the end of the processional, as they're leaving the church, she pulls the mistress and her son in to walk in line with her behind her husband. Y'all, I think I love this episode so much because there's not a whole lot going on. It's nothing crazy. It's just a sad story about women solely bearing the shames of men. Don't get me wrong. No, you should not be banging nobody's husband. That's absolutely not what I'm trying to say here. What I'm trying to say is that the parallels between the two relationships are an interesting feat to see. You get a glimpse of who Olivia and Melly could turn out to be. Olivia doesn't want to be a secret. She wants to be able to love Fitz out loud. Millie wants her husband to be loyal, but because he loves Olivia, that's never going to happen. And the men are nearly absolved of all guilt. One, because now the pastor's dead and his wife has to save his reputation for him. And because Fitz is the president and can nearly do anything he wants and Millie has to protect him. That brings me to my favorite character of season 2A, which is Melody Margaret Grant, aka the first lady of the United States. Millie is my favorite character of season 2A because let me back up a little bit. In the final episode of season 1, Millie, with the help of Liv, come up with a plan to save Fitz's presidency. She had to stick her neck out for embarrassment, proclaiming that she was on the sex tape and not his mistress. She literally sacrifices her body for Fitz in the opener because she's pregnant because that's what she promised to do to save him like this woman literally made a baby to save her husband's political career the girl is ruthless but honest she's accepted her place in Fitz's life whether he wants her there or not and most of the time it's not season one she told Liv that she was taking her husband back and in season two we see her trying to do that over and over again in episode three she literally yells at Fitz to get over her and that if he sees her again she'll blow him away and that's she's an excellent shot like Millie is that girl she knows where her power is and she's a political genius and she's a pro-vaccine republican so we know all her screws are tied up there she stands up for what's right even if it means going against her husband she calls Olivia at some point because she can push aside her differences when they'll benefit her and she's a ride or die chick and we find that out over and over again because she would risk almost all of it for Fitz Let's get into my least favorite character of this season, 2A. It's gotta be Abby. Abby is just so annoying right now. Literally from the opener, she will not shut up about Quinn and she just keeps dragging it on. Everyone else is okay with defending her, but Abby just won't shut up. Like, dude, it's not all about you sometimes. And then she ends up quite literally sleeping with the enemy, David Rosen. Like, technically, I guess David's not the real enemy, but David is trying to take them down, Loki. She finds out about David's creepy spy wall and does nothing to protect the group. Like, for the most part, she just kind of whines and complains about everything. She starts to help David even on his quest. 
I mean, she really did like David and Liv wanted them broken up to protect her though, which I think is fair. But I do think the way that Harrison and Liv went about breaking them up was incredibly messed up. They painted David to be an abuser and knowing Abby's history of barely leaving her husband's abusive relationship, that was definitely wrong. Time for the most shocking part of season 2A, and it kind of leaves on a cliffhanger, but I'm not even going to count it this time. So the most shocking part of season 2A is episode 8 titled, Happy Birthday day mr president don't make fun of my singing now to talk about this i have to talk about what happened just seconds before even though technically it was the episode before but fitz gets shot yes you heard that right the president of the united states gets shot walking into his birthday party and as you can guess anything bad that could happen pretty much happened the entire opener is stressful you have fitz on a gurney as the doctor screaming at him stay with me mr president and you have millie getting checked out and screaming and slapping the doctors wanting to know where her husband and her children are and olivia's freaking out too because the man that she loved just got shot in the head in the middle of a crowd of people we see them rushing away the cabinet members from the scene just in case another attack happens you see them rushing away the vice president because she's next in line and they need to protect her but this just isn't any old vice president this vice president for the most part does whatever she wants she gets on the helicopter and tells the pilot who's a marine that since the president might be dead that right now she's the commander-in-chief and that they need to take her to the south lawn of the white house sally lands on the lawn and gets right in front of the cameras and makes a statement Liv is back at the white house and quickly jumps into the role of running things again because it's just who she is cyrus meets sally in the oval office and screams at her like this man is yelling and turning red and the veins are popping but wow technically she isn't the president because fitz is not dead yet he sends her away because it's a matter of national security and she goes because she knows that she has a duty to her country at the end of the day and when we enter into some flashback sequences we see Fitz and Liv in the thick of their affair and seeing these clips feels a little dirty because he might be dead and this would be all the memory she had of him of her doing some shameful things in the oval office also in the flashback Millie and Fitz show up to Liv's house at some point because Millie wanted to hang out because at this point she doesn't know about the affair and they have a pretty good friendship going this upsets Liv and she tells Fitz how horrible it makes her feel y'all I just gotta let you hear it because it's truly an upsetting conversation. I smile at her and I take off my clothes for you. I wait for you. I watch for you. My whole life is you. I can't breathe because I'm waiting for you. You own me. You control me. I, I belong to you. You own me. You control me. I belong to you. You think I don't want to be a better man. You think that I don't want to dedicate myself to my marriage. You don't think I want to be honorable to be the man that you voted for. I love you. I'm in love with you. You're the love of my life. Ugh. Do y'all feel the pain? Because I definitely do. Then we get back into the present. Liv has to go talk to Melly, And when she sits, Melly puts her in her place. She goes to retrieve an outfit from Melly, And while she's in their joint closet, she cries into one of Fitz's sweatshirts. And that's the first time we see her cry over Fitz in this episode. We jump back into the flashback where we see Fitz let Olivia touch the Constitution of the United States. And apparently she's been the seventh person to do so. Because he was the sixth. Their affair is revealed to Melly officially by two secret service agents that we often see in the background. Millie uses the old, I will say something, and if you blink, it's true. And that gives her all the information she needs about Fitz and Liv going behind her back. Fitz is announced to be alive in a coma but still in the land of the living and has made it out of surgery so millie gives a patriotic duty speech to address the public in the small scene we see how at the end of the day olivia may have his heart but millie has his name and she will always be in the background back in the flashback olivia submits her resignation on the evening of the state of the union address and officially leaves the white house back in the present sally essentially planned a coup to be enacted as the president under the 25th amendment and we see her sworn in and now for the most shocking bit of season 2a is that we go back to the night that Fitz was shot and see Huck packing up the gun that was used to shoot the president of the United States and that's where we're gonna end this episode guys we'll pick up with 2b and probably all of season 3 I'm not sure if we'll make it to our 20 day goal but we're gonna try anyway be sure to follow the pod's social media pages and feel free to recommend your favorite show. Make sure you're following the pod on Instagram at RewatchPod and Twitter at RewatchPod underscore for more content. And lastly, please rate the pod five stars. Anyways, back to binging. Try and catch me.